Hey guys, it's Christy, and welcome to another episode of A Different Atheist Reads, A History of God by Karen Armstrong. I am doing this video from the Fox Valley in Wisconsin, where I've been spending the day with the 4th of July with my family, and now I'm out in the grass and I'm having lots of ants run all over me, so I might be a little bit distracted. But I wanted to get on with chapter 7, because we were making good progress and we want to keep up with it. This chapter is called The God of the Mystics, and in my opinion, Karen kind of loses the plot in this chapter. It's becoming very clear that Karen, instead of presenting facts and independent information and presenting a history of God, is really putting out an agenda. And she thinks somehow that she can convince us that her worldview is right simply by repeating the same things over and over and casting history through the lens that she wants to see it. And by the time we get to the God of the Mystics, it's really becoming clear what her agenda is. And that is that she rejects the idea of a personal God that we saw in sort of the early parts of the Bible. And she rejects the idea that you can rationally get to God as we saw with her review of the Greeks. Instead, what she's pretty convinced of is that there's a progression of human history of religious experience and the highest point of that progression is mysticism. So let's get started and we're gonna plow through 60 plus more pages of Karen's BS. She starts off her chapter making a rather I think ridiculous claim and I'll go ahead and quote her here. The personal God has helped monotheists to value the sacred and inalienable rights of the individual and to cultivate an appreciation of human personality. The Judeo-Christian tradition has thus helped the West to acquire the liberal humanism it values so highly. The two key words in that sentence are liberal and humanism, neither of which appear in the holy text or are even supported by the holy texts that we've looked at so far. The truth is that in the Jewish texts, the only people who were recognized as legal citizens were Jewish men. Foreigners were not considered citizens. Women didn't count. Children didn't have any rights. And in the Christian text, free men um, had rights, but slaves and women and other people did not. So this self-perpetuating idea that Christians and um, the, especially tell themselves about the source of modern secular liberal humanism is that they somehow invented it when the fact is that the first step in establishing universal human rights and the idea of human rights is to reject these texts that place people in a hierarchy of power on page 249 Karen makes her agenda quite plain I'll quote the prophets of Israel attributed their own emotions and passions to God Christianity made a human person the center of religious life Yet a personal God can become a grave liability. He can become a mere idol carved in our own image. It seems, therefore, that the idea of a personal God can only be a stage in our religious development. Seems, therefore, to whom? Nobody but Karen. This is her conclusion. This isn't a logical observation. And it's certainly not the trend. Religions haven't become increasingly mystical over time. If anything, we see more of the kind of personal relationship with God perpetuating monotheism than any other option. So again, she's not being honest here. She's just promoting her agenda. The slide uh, here is entitled, rather than sticking to the text, just make it up. And that's kind of what she's advocating here in the next section. She writes, I quote, the central motif of these prophetic religions, that being the monotheistic ones, is confrontation or personal meeting between God and humanity. This God relates to human beings by means of a dialogue rather than silent contemplation. Mystical religion is more immediate and tends to be more help in time of trouble than a predominantly cerebral faith. So here she's starting to set up this idea that a personal God is inferior to a mystical God, which is her opinion and which is what she's going to work through the rest of this chapter. She talks about Jewish mysticism initially in the chapter, just how she sort of starts out talking about it, relating stories about how the holy fire descended upon some rabbi and his followers as if this was an historical event and not some kind of religiously induced experience, hallucination. And she talks about, again, this whole idea that if you go on a mystical journey, somehow it's super dangerous and you've got to be really prepared and you've got to take it um, seriously and need people to guide you through this. And this is a, an opinion she has. It's not like she presents studies or anything to substantiate this. It's just an assertion, like most of Karen's assertions, that she makes over and over without substantiation. We also see that she uh, then does her trick of asserting what people really did and didn't think. Quote, 
Jewish mystics did not imagine that they were really flying through the sky or entering God's palace, but were marshalling the religious images that filled their minds in a controlled and ordered way. Again, how does she know this? This happened hundreds of years ago, according, you know, when we're talking about like during pre-enlightenment times, how does she know? Another value-laden comment she writes is, visions are not ends in themselves, but a mean to an ineffable religious experience that exceeds normal concepts. It is a mistake for the visionary to see these mental apparitions as objective or as anything more than a symbol of transcendence. Again, Karen's opinion, not fact. And again, I think exposing her hand. Uh, I've entitled this side, slide, make shit up and then call it too profound to be described. She discusses a religious movement um, introducing the two essential ingredients in the mystical portrait of God, which are common to all three faiths. It is essentially imaginative. Secondly, it is ineffable. My take on what Karen is really talking about in this chapter is people emotionally seeking a transcendent experience. And I've called this slide, slide like mushrooms are easier, dude. Uh, it seems to be the case that what she's talking about here are the kind of mental preparations, the fasting, the repetition of words, working yourself up into a trance in order to induce some sort of ecstatic experience. And if that's what they're looking for, then it just seems like these people are looking to get high on God and they don't want to, you know, reducing it to that is would pro they would probably find it offensive. But in order to escape their everyday reality and get caught up in this mystical relationship, it does seem to me the kind of thrill seeking that people who do drugs seek. They want to get a break away from their reality. And in this case, it's doing it um, by the means that other people do, you know, special breathing techniques, meditation techniques, everything else to, to work your brain up and fire off those bits of the experience of your brain that seems to create one and a sense of joy and overwhelmingness. And then they induce these experiences of in, t in themselves and call that God, which is just making stuff up. To really tie, how, tie in how much this is about getting high, she then talks about the ways that various faiths have had this notion of a ladder or an ascension into heaven. You're actually getting higher on God. Gabriel and Muhammad began the perilous ascent up a ladder through the seven heavens. St. Augustine had experienced an ascent to God with his mother at Ostia. The experience of God that is finally attained is utterly indescribable since normal language no longer applies. Blah, 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 blah. God in a box. It's so awesome. It exists, but we can't describe it. But it's ultimate reality. But we can't say what that is. And we can induce it in ourselves, but it's outside ourselves. And blah, 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 blah. More of Karen's typical blah, blah, blah. And this is, this for me was really ridiculous. Although it is culturally conditioned, this kind of ascent seems an incontrovertible fact of life. However we choose to interpret it, people all over the world and in all phases of history have had this type of contemplative experience. The point is that this is something that human beings who have a certain spiritual talent have always wanted to do. The mystical experience of God has certain characteristics that are common to all faiths. It is a subjective experience that involves an interior journey, not a perception of an objective fact outside the self. It is an undertaking through the imagination, sorry, the imagine-making part of the mind, often called the imagination, rather than through the more cerebral, logical facilities, or sorry, faculties. I'm getting distracted by, there are little ants crawling on my legs. Blanket, much better. Right, so Karen's explanation is that um, people in all cultures have had these ascent experiences and this common theme of spiritual experience is pervasive in all human societies. And what else? The mystical experience of God has certain characteristics and it's a subjective experience not based on an objective fact. Doesn't it, isn't it an easier and more simple explanation to say that we all have very similar brain structures? And our brains are capable of producing an experience of losing the sense of where you end and other things begin uh, by meditation, as we know, or the God box stimulating parts of your brain. And that that's the explanation for people's experiences. Not that there's an unknown, ineffable reality behind reality that wants to communicate with us but can't and so everyone creates their own experience using their imagination to talk to this ultimate reality surely brain structure is a more fact-based easily testable rational explanation for people's experiences 
And if Karen or any other mystic wants to provide evidence of this ineffable, ineffable reality that they keep going on about in a way that's coherent and cogent and can make sense to somebody besides you and your own personal experience, well, then they can maybe make a convincing argument. But until then, I'm going with brain structures. Karen then, again, there's no structure to these chapters. She just seems to go on a, a stream of consciousness and then she moves from this discussion of mysticism into discussing icons and iconoclasm and that people who don't have these special mystical talents, in other words, their brains aren't highly susceptible to these induced religious experiences, could glimpse this other experience through looking at pictures. Again, another empty assertion that just makes sense in Karen's head but has no basis in reality. From page 265. It was useless to define the God who effected this transformation since he was beyond speech and description, yet as an experience that fulfilled and transfigured humanity without violating its integrity, God was an incontrovertible reality. Karen then goes on to talk about um, is a mysticism in Islam and I won't do a lot of these quotes I'm just gonna pull another one out that sort of exemplifies sorry I keep checking for bugs on me because I was so used to having ants crawl all over my legs I'm still a little bit like when I feel my hair going is that an ant is that a bug um, so get back to the quote we're gonna discuss again Karen making empty assertions from page 268 yet again this was no external deity out there alien to mankind God was discovered to be mysteriously identified with the inmost self, which basically means people were making it up. In the chapter, she then touches on more personal tales of individual mystics, the dangers of mysticism. In other words, people who are emotionally unstable, who start down this path, become more emotionally unstable. And it just seems to be not a problem with the dangers of mysticism. Maybe it's more a reflection of the kind of people who are attracted to mysticism. She also discusses the dis antagonism between the mystics and the religious establishment and the fact that the establishment people were putting mystics to death. So clearly this isn't some sort of natural progression that it was obvious to everybody as it Karen claims it to me, but rather sex of religion, people having different experiences and making up their own stuff and people who make up stuff A have fights with people who make up stuff B and people with A have more power so they killed off the people with B. And the fact that they're religious and they're even in the same religion and they worship the same God doesn't stop them from killing each other. So if the ultimate reality God that is producing all these wonderful experiences can't induce its own followers to not kill each other, I'm not entirely sure what the good of this practice is, what these practices are. And more of this sort of, I, I don't know, she makes a lot of contradictory assertions. And this is an, another one. I call this slide, as you'll see, how to justify your self-delusion. I'm going to pick up on the last line in this slide. The only way we can conceive of God who remains imperceptible to the senses and to logical proof is by means of symbols, which is the chief function of the imaginative mind to interpret. It does, it's, it's crap. It's just crap. Karen really wants people to basically rely on things that they feel good about and make them feel good about themselves and make them nice people, which is fine. But to subjectively pick out a cherry pick elements and call that God, I think is really disingenuous because it ends up taking that goodness away from humans and gives it away to something that is not human, leaving us always deficient. And that's one of my biggest problems with theism, is especially Christianity, is that it, and not so much in Judaism to be fair, but it takes humans and all the good they do and it robs them of that dignity of their good and gives all of that goodness and, and attributes, attributes it to God. And everything that's negative and bad, it attributes to humans. And that's a really distorted way of seeing people. And I think Karen also promotes this kind of stuff and she encourages it more dangerously by it, rejecting the idea that reason um, can be, uh, you know, the fact that if you use reason you can't understand God is a reason to reject reasoning, not a reason to re reject the concept. So she says here, Reason alone will not enable us to perceive the special, the universal, or the eternal in a particular temporal object. That is the task of the creative imagination to which mystics, like artists, attribute their insight. 
I don't want to keep banging on about the fact that she's just making things up and asserting things that are not true, but she keeps making things up and asserting things that are not true. You can't imagine yourself a new diamond ring. You can't imagine yourself the ability to fly any more than you can imagine an ultimate reality of God into existence just because you want there to be one. She talks more than about more mystical personal stories. Then she starts talking about Dante and the Divine Comedy and then goes back to another um, Muslim mystic called Ibn al-Arabi. And I'm going to complain again, this chapter has no structure. We're just wandering along the path. It's like Karen, this is like the first draft of the book. It's like she wrote it the first time and then never read it again. She wrote it through once and never thought to read it and think, does this make sense? How is the reader going to approach this? How is this going to make sense uh, in terms of the progression of ideas and connecting things together? And what is the purpose of this chapter? And where are we going? Let's just say if this book was a journey, it would be one where you had no maps and you had no access to like Google Maps or anything else. You were wandering along maybe with you know, the sun as a goal if it was around. And I do feel like Karen is just writing as if she's getting paid by the word. One of the things that I notice about people who take on this version of religious, this view of religious experience is that they think that it's okay that everyone goes out looking for God and comes up with a different answer. And the difference between religious experiences like this and reality, let's say the scientific method is, the scientific method narrows on a single explanation. Whether it's quantum physics, whether it's atomic theory, whether it's the theory of gravity, whether it's plate tectonics, the theory of evolution, germ theory, all of these theories end up, you can have initial explanations. Phrenology is a good example. It might have, you know, sure, if you have bumps on your head, maybe that relates to inside your skull, the bigger parts of your brain. But then we realized that phrenology was crap because the bumps on the outside of the head don't matter. And so we chucked phrenology and then we went on to psychology and neuropsychology and actually studying the brain. Um, and those disciplines, because they are disciplined, converge on a single account, a single causal explanation that can be tested and that we can have confidence in because we try to prove it wrong again and again and we can't. We can't overcome, we can't false, you know, we overcome the null hypothesis and the theory still holds. What Karen is basically saying is that everyone should just make up their own definition and I don't see how you can call that truth. I can't just say 2 plus 2 equals 5 and it be valid or 2 plus 2 equals 7 and someone else says 2 plus 2 equals 8 and another person say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and somehow these are all valid responses and yet this is the kind of mentality that Karen would have us approach or use when approaching the biggest question of whether or not there's a supernatural ultimate reality that exists and her answer is just make up your own. From page 281 this introspective, imaginative mysticism was a search for the ground of being in the depths of the self. Since each man and woman had had a unique experience of God, it followed that no one religion could express the whole of the divine mystery. There was no objective truth about God to which all must subscribe. Since this God transcended the category of personality, predictions about his behavior and inclinations were impossible. It just sounds like garbage to me. Blah, 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 Karen, blah, blah, blah. So she talks more about Ibn al-Arabi, more about the history of the Sufis. She talks about another Sufi rock star named Rumi for a bit. And then she goes back to the Jews and talks about German piousists. Uh, coherence, logical progression of these, connecting these ideas? No, no. I have a, another slide that's called Cloud Cuckoo because that's what I think really typifies or like sort of summarizes the views. I'll go, uh, I, and I, it's just more of the same in all honesty, so I'm going to spare you more details. There is this one thing though that she does. She starts talking about Jewish mysticism and she goes into great detail 
discussing um, what people have basically pulled out of their ass and said, oh, this is God. And it has to do with like these different aspects, these 10 different aspects or these t 10 different emanations or numerations of the divine reality, which had emanated from the inscrutable depths of the unknowable Godhead, which is just more bullshit piled on top of more bullshit. And I'm not going to make you go into it. I'll just put up a slide here of the diagram that she uses when she talks through people making stuff up about God. And it's about, as I say here, it's about as useful as a map of Atlantis and about as credible. And she, she really does take time in her chapter to explain this, but our time is way too valuable. She goes on to talk about another Jewish mystic, which we're not going to talk about. And then we get to the end. Hurrah! Karen goes over a list of what various mystics asserted about the God that they made up. And then she writes, in the next chapter, we shall see that the god of the Kabbalists became dominant in Jewish spirituality during the 16th century. As a result of the Reformation, Europe began to see God in still more rationalistic terms. And then, looking ahead, the next chapter is called, um, like, the god of the rationalists or something like that. And it's, I, I've done the review, I just can't remember the name of the chapter title right now. It's actually less coherent than this one. So you guys have that to look forward to. Uh, in, in summary, I, I know Karen has a, an agenda to promote mysticism as an alternative to a more formulaic, personality-based, treating God as if he was another being, the way basically he's described in the Bible and Jesus, and the way that it's described in the Quran by Muhammad. All of those things Karen wants to work against and say, no, 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 that's not really what God is. What God is is that wonderful, warm, cozy feeling inside. Ooh. And if you can just get caught up in it, and you're really careful because it's quite dangerous to be that happy, but if you can just caught, get caught up in that lovely, lovely, woo-woo inside feeling, that's God. I don't find her convincing. And if you're watching this channel, probably you don't either, but uh, I, I, at least we're making progress, we're getting through it, and I guess uh, on this 4th of July, that's a pretty good thing. So, I don't know if you guys can see, uh, now that the, the book stuff is done, um, if you're interested in the next chapter, you can go ahead for the next video when it's up, otherwise you can stop the video here. I'll just give you a little uh, personal like update now. So, I am in Wisconsin, it's 4th of July, we've just spent some time with my family, and uh, I'll go ahead, there's a really nice, beautiful nature bit here, so maybe I'll do a little bit of video and you can get a sense of the country side and uh, the feeling, the relaxation. It's really nice to be back in the States. I'm eating crap. Oh, I'm eating so much crap. I'm eating so much disgusting deep dish. I was in Chicago, so I gotta get deep dish pizza while you're in Chicago, because you're in Chicago and they have deep dish pizza. That's the place to get it. Um, eating a lot of steak, eating a lot of sugar, drinking root beer. I don't get root beer in Germany. Um, all kinds of things. I'm probably gonna end up uh, waddling <laughs> onto the camera next time because I'm eating so many bad things. But it's been very enjoyable to be back. I got to visit Chicago for a few days, spend some time being a bit of a tourist. That was a lot of fun. Lovely city, beautiful architecture. Um, and I got uh, wonderful shots. I had a lot of, spent some time just taking pictures behind the camera. It was a lot of fun. And it's been perfect weather here and a very nice holiday. In terms of my schedule, I, I'm trying to keep to a regular schedule, but when I was in Chicago, for instance, they wanted $15 a day for the Wi-Fi, and that was just a standard Wi-Fi, not even the high-speed stuff, and it was, I just, um, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up a regular schedule when I'm traveling so much. So I'm going to put this video out, and I don't know when I'll get the next one out, but know that I feel an obligation, so I'm not going to abandon you guys or abandon the channel, even if I don't produce on a regular basis. It's not because I don't still love you, it's not because I don't want to finish the book, it's just usually I don't have time or I don't have access to the internet or those kinds of things. But you know, you guys are always so patient with me and I, I'm very, very appreciative. So yeah, I guess that's about it. And until next time, I've been Christy, you've been 4th of July awesome, and we're going to continue on with the next chapter. Oh, it just gets worse really from here with Karen, but that's okay because it's going to be fun to get through it. Um, we can say we did it and that, as Joss Whedon said, we will have accomplished the impossible and that will make us mighty. Talk to you guys later. Bye. It is a mistake for the visionary to see these things 
getting distracted by the ants. Mystics did not want a straightforward dialogue with a god whom they experienced as an overwhelming holiness rather than a sympathetic friend and father. Trying that second one again. I'm gonna go get a blanket. I'm gonna be right back. 